Hi, my name is Andrew Van Lint, and we're returning for another video on Coding Matters, and I'm delighted to be joined by Jane Andrews. Jane, what do you do? Hi, um, I'm a medical manager and also a practicing gastroenterologist. I'm looking after the surgery program, in particular all the GI focused activity, and it's medical and surgical. So we have gastroenterology, liver diseases, upper GI, hep bill, colorectal, and trauma surgery. Fantastic, quite a mixture there. It is, at yeah. least it's all sort of focused on the gut. Yep. So we know each other well and we understand each other well. So we're gonna have a focus really on gastrointestinal issues that we'll yep. have a bit of overlap with our previous gastro one, but mm -hmm. with a bit more procedural focus. Yep. Uh, I'm delighted to always have a fellow physician on the video, but particularly- But I do represent the surgeons. So. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and, and looking for that senior management or executive perspective yeah. on why documentation and, and coding is important. Yeah, and I think that's a really important place to start because unless we've won the hearts and minds and convinced people why coding matters, it's really hard to talk to people about why they should change their practice and why they should document in a different way. So um, we need to ensure that we're able to fund and deliver sustainable healthcare. And if we don't capture the complexity and all the detail in the work that we're doing, then we can't actually resource individual units. And that's um, you know, a real problem. We also can't see what is the real cost of delivering the care at a whole of hospital level. So we can't argue for the right resourcing for hospitals. And then we don't see all the complications and all the complexity in individual patients. And so we can't do the commissioning, which is the future look and the future planning for healthcare well. And so I think there's lots of good reasons why coding matters. Because mm. I suppose at a management level, you know, there's sometimes discussion about budgets and it's a lot of focus on expenditure, but making sure our income, which is, you know, really informed by the coding, mm. is secure and is, you know, appropriate to the amount of work and resource expenditure we're doing is really uh, just as important as the expenditure. Oh, look, I think it's really important and budgets are important and they're important because it's taxpayers' dollars. Mm. And nobody who pays tax want to wants to think that their money is not being used well. Certainly not. We are taxpayers as well. We are taxpayers <laughs> ourselves and so are most of our patients. And so it shouldn't be about seeing the dollar value, it should be about seeing the value proposition. So did we spend that amount of money on you because you needed that amount of care and it made you better? Or did we not document sufficiently and we can't tell whether we got good value for your money? It's not mm. actually our money, yep. it, it's all of our money together. So I think it's a really important thing. I don't want people to think that it's all around budgets though and it's all around cost savings. It's about being able to demonstrate what was done, was it worthwhile, and so that we can plan ahead if we're going to be needing to deliver that again next year so that we can get the budget adjustments. Mm. And I suppose on top of the, the money side, there is the elements of making sure that the measurement of our clinical performance as a Absolutely. unit, as an organisation, is appropriate, or if it's not, we can identify where we need to Absolutely. improve. And there's the element which I know that you're passionate about, which is about the research side and the quality improvement. Yep. And if we're not coding things appropriately, you know, even basic things like an audit becomes a lot more arduous. Impossible. So it becomes the garbage in, garbage out problem. Anyone who has done any clinical research will know that if your data is not coded well, and I don't just mean in terms of the medical coding according to the coding standards, I just mean that if we don't know that we're comparing apples with apples or mm. oranges with oranges, and we can't find every case of wound dehiscence, or we can't find every case where we had malnutrition because we didn't document well, then our research data and our clinical outcomes data and our ability to run quality improvement projects it's really severely impaired. So I think there's loads of good reasons why accurate data capture and accurate documentation matter. Mm, absolutely. So just a reminder, um, as we're going to be talking about some clinical scenarios and how the documentation informs that, that coding is about looking at the documentation to ensure there's a clear diagnostic condition that's been named um, that will inform their disease-related group. And then we have the appropriate examination history and investigation findings to support that diagnosis and a care plan. Those are the three essential ingredients to make sure that we can code in a quality way and we need the documentation to support that. Uh, we'd like to talk briefly because I think one of the biggest areas that we could improve mm. in the gastrointestinal space, whether it be from um, the medical or the surgical side, is about having the relationship that's been clearly documented between the big name items like the reason for presentation, like the major surgical procedure that's been done um, or the particular condition that's been diagnosed 
is linked with the complications and the other associated conditions. So again, that kind of casual relationship, you know, saying this is due to this, this is related to this, this is following from this issue. So uh, the particular ones we love to use is due to or secondary to, it just makes a very clear relationship between those two things. Uh, and as well, we often talk about diagnostic uncertainty. You don't always need to be completely certain that they're related, mm -hmm. saying that this is likely or mm -hmm. you know probably related yep. to, it's okay to express a degree of uncertainty uh, until such time that is you're able to confirm that. Yeah, I think that's really important because we make lots of assumptions. I mean, when we're experienced in a particular area, we will know that something is due to or secondary to something. And so we have already made that link in our minds. And so we're not explicit, we don't spell it out. The problem is that in medical school, we go to university and learn one language and the coders go to their coding school and they learn a different language. And if we don't work out a way that we can document in a way that they are allowed to score the condition, A, that it was diagnosed during that illness, also that we had evidence to support the diagnosis and then we had some management that was necessary because we don't care if someone's just got something if we didn't manage it in that encounter then we can't allocate a resource to it so you know if i've got a sore ankle that i've had forever but i had an appendectomy nobody cares about my sore ankle nobody cares. unless it delayed my discharge mm. and i then had to see the physio and then i had to get assessed by the ot and then i got some strengthening exercises so spell it out don't be you know, embarrassed, don't think it's silly to be really explicit and say, look, you know, kind of someone's had you know, an appendicectomy due to appendicitis. And post-operatively, they may have had an ileus, but don't just write an ileus, we'll show you some examples. Say it was due to their surgery. Mm. And that little bit makes a huge difference in terms of how the coding works. Yeah, we'll look at some examples in a moment, but though, you know, we're, it's about looking at those habits. We're in a habit of saying post-op pain, post-op immobility, post-op ileus. That can't code, unfortunately. Like We know as clinicians mm. what we mean, but there's an assumption that we put there and we need to mm. be explicit and specific and say that it is due pain to. due to surgery, it is ileus secondary to surgery or previous adhesions or whatever it is that's, that's happened. Yeah. Let's get into some surgery because yeah. um, that's, Great, that's the yeah, big area and uh, we, we have a very um, lively, active um, surgical service here. Uh, your particular area, a lot of oncological cancer, yeah, we do a lot of cat one resections cancer, yeah. and things, so a lot of things that need to be be done urgently or semi-urgently. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of different ways. Something that I learned through this process is that um, what we may have you know, entitled the procedure or the surgery as is not necessarily what it gets coded as. Um, the coding yeah. can be quite different. And so being really descriptive in your operation note, dear procedural colleagues, um, <laughs> is going to be really, it's, it's rich. It's not only making sure that if um, your colleagues or yourself return to the anatomical site in the future so that you know what has been done and what was found, mm. but from a coding perspective, it, it, it's a rich data source that enables yeah. us to code in a very accurate way. And I think a lot of our colleagues don't realise how much um, review goes into those operative notes. Look, I and think, the yeah, care. it's a really, really important thing because some of the systems looking at what's performed use what are called the CMBS codes, which is the Commonwealth Medicare Benefit Schedule codes. Mm -hmm. However, that's not how the NWOWs and the coding for inpatient funding is worked out. And if we don't describe the procedure in detail, like down to whether there were serosal tears that were repaired, whether there were adhesions divided, whether the adhesions were due to previous surgery in that area, um, we're just not going to really see the complexity of the operation that is delivered. In S3, we've actually had some really important examples that we found in the last couple of years. We offer two very specialised services. One is pelvic exenteration mm. for people who've got advanced pelvic malignancy. Very complex procedure. Absolutely. I mean, it's a terrible procedure in a way because so many organs are removed from the pelvis. And if the operation note doesn't cover all of the organs that are removed and all of the complexity of the surgery, then we find that we are very under-resourced because it doesn't have a funding item on its own. And we've been working with the coding unit to actually get better coding there so that we are funded a bit better for the pelvic exenteration. We also offer another service called HIPEC, which is um, heated interperitoneal chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And again, that's a very specialised service 
run for people, particularly with pseudomyxoma peritonei. And again, we were being underfunded because of a lack of description, because these patients often will have a debulking procedure with a number of organs removed mm. before the um, intraperitoneal chemotherapy is um, delivered. Used. Yeah. So it's really important. It, it actually matters because you can't run the services if we don't see what the work was. No, and I think that's that's a really important point. Mm. Of a lot of these advanced procedures are very costly, yeah. and a lot of the equipment that we need is is also you know resource intensive. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that we're getting the the funding to match what we're spending. Yeah, and we need the allied health. Um, and so if we don't talk about the nutritional needs, um, we don't get our dietitians, we don't mm. talk about the mental health problems, we don't get our psychological support, if we don't talk about the stoma problems, we don't get our stoma therapists, and then we have physio and OT, all sorts of other people who are really important. Mm. Um, ICU is important as well, as is whether someone has got ATSI status. So if someone identifies as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, there are additional you know, resources allocated and that's because we know they have general health disadvantage. If people need dialysis, even if it's short term or radiation therapy, they are other things that we might not always see as important in surgical coding, but they really are. So we talked a lot about you know what procedures were done, things mm. that were removed. But even in that first part of when the scope goes in, or at first the that uh, cavity is opened, mm. describing things that are there that maybe shouldn't be. Yeah, the free findings. fluid, yes. free blood, yep. an abscess that wasn't found on the mm -hmm, CT scan, mm -hmm. a mass that is bigger than expected. Yep. Those are things. A, a adhesions, perforation, perforation. Adhesions, describing absolutely. that in detail is going to again add to the richness of that data set and obviously inform the procedure. And again, it might have been listed as a simple cholecystectomy and it turns out to be a lot more of a complex procedure. And we do a lot of not simple cholecystectomies here we found when we've audited the data. And lastly, you know, critical care goes a lot with these very advanced surgical procedures mm. and so the amount of time that they spend in ICU, mm -hmm. the amount of time that they spend intubated yep. and ventilated, um, the, the time of which starts um, 24 hours after their surgery or if they were intubated pre-surgery that counts from then and so those things are huge weights and if we don't mm. write them we're missing out on that. Yeah, no, that's really important. So here's a couple of examples really just plain to what we were just talking about uh, in terms of procedures. So talking about uh, and separating whether something is related to the surgery that has just been performed mm -hmm. versus previous surgery is really important. So we often document um, the finding of adhesions whether it be that we're noticing there are some features on the CT or when we do the procedure we find adhesions and need to divide them. Document that they are from previous surgery, which is 99% of them are from that, mm. is important. And band adhesions and whether the small bowel obstruction is related to the band adhesions related to the previous surgery. Being explicit about that due to secondary to, we have to yeah. put that relationship there. And it's just spelling it out because we made an assumption, we write shorthand and then we miss the coding. And again, you can see some examples there, um, you know, due to surgery here. Obstru mm -hmm. Obstruction due to surgery, not the previous surgery, the current one. Yeah. Um, you know, impaction of intestine, uh, an ileus or paralytic ileus, uh, ileus, sorry, or acute blood loss, anemia due to surgery. You're just linking them. It's a few words mm. and it can seem a bit pedantic, but it makes such a huge difference to the end outcome on our performance and the outcome on funding and the end outcome on audit capability. Yeah. Um, here's an example, uh, so this patient's been admitted for 10 days with an ischemic bowel, hypotension, dehydration and acute kidney injury. Sounds like uh, uh, could come in any Standard day of the week. emergency department yes. presentation. Uh, and they had adhesions that were divided during uh, a surgery for a colectomy mm -hmm. and that would come out with minor complexity of around $16,000 funding. Obviously that person needed appropriate care. Now let's, the same person yeah. with just slight changes to the wording that better reflect uh, the specificity of what happened Again, same issues, and the only change here is we've gone the adhesions due to previous surgery puts them into an immediate intermediate complexity. So we provided exactly the same care in the same scenario, yeah. but those extra four words uh, almost doubled the funding up to twenty six and a half thousand dollars. Like that's a huge difference from just four words. Exactly. Worth my time. Worth, worth my worth, time. Yeah. W worth every everyone's time because that actually makes a difference to funding and resourcing units, mm. and that means that we can deliver the care better and sustainably. Do you want to talk us through this one, Jane? Yeah, so this is another good example. This is someone who was in for 10 days, so that's a really long length of stay because in my units, length of stay is generally under five days. We're pretty quick, pretty slick. Um, they came in with ischemic bowel. We don't know how old they are, but these people are often quite frail. They're often elderly. They've often got cardiovascular risk factors. Otherwise, they wouldn't get ischemic gut. 
uh, colectomy was performed, so it was quite severe, the ischemia, general anaesthetic. They got a nasogastric tube and they had an X-ray uh, because they had what was documented as post-procedural ileus. Now, this is coming out as a minor complexity on the way it's documented currently. Nobody at the end of the bed test thinks this is minor complexity. Mm. But if we make the simple change, saying that the nasogastric tube and the X-ray were done to manage the ileus, which was due to the surgery, um, we go up into intermediate complexity. Now, I would guess that if we really looked at that patient, that we would have found perhaps hypertension, diabetes, um, perhaps cognitive impairment, and other things that may have been managed during that admission that we made assumptions about and we didn't clearly signal in our notes. Because if someone stayed 10 days in this day and age, they have had a lot of care. They've mm. needed a lot of care. I mean, those geriatric syndromes. Uh, absolutely. You know, delirium. I'd be very surprised. Malnutrition. If there yep. Deconditioning. deconditioning. Sarcopenia. Yep. All of those are going to add. So it's 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 actually happening. It's whether we're writing it and capturing that data or not. Absolutely. We're doing the work. So let's document it so we can see it. Um, here's a, a multi-factor example of that. Uh, just again reinforcing. So same kind of scenario. Ten days ischemic bowel. I think um, it's the same patient actually. Very similar. Uh, limited colectomy and division of adhesions performed under general anaesthetic okay so far nasogastric tube and x-ray for post-procedural ileus again oh post-procedural we know that yeah, one is not, not a good term yeah. uh, comes out of minor now let's just tweak that wording yep. a little bit to better reflect what happened mm. we've got adhesions due to previous surgery just a few extra words there um, repair of an intraoperative cirrhosal tears so better operative yeah, yeah better operative documentation absolutely and then we've got nasogastric tube and x-ray for an ileus due to surgery mm -hmm. being the addition again and just a few extra words and lastly an iron infusion for iron deficiency anemia we are giving a lot of iron and a lot and of blood it's a to great these thing. patients it's a, it's a good iron thing. infusions fantastic love it as let's a document big fan. why we've given them though and yes. making it due to iron deficiency is really important so this might have been the same management, but because we wrote it specifically, that's a difference between $16,000 and $52,000. I think all of our heads of units would just love to know this, and they'd love to know that all of our junior doctors and registrars are documenting it well. Mm, absolutely. So here are um, some, again, reinforcing, and this is a, a bit of a reference one that you've got mm. here, um, the interventions, again, reinforcing the idea of due to, secondary to, due to, secondary to, that's there. Mm. Um, and then we've got some associated conditions that add complexity. So each of these kind of add points towards increasing the complexity from minor to intermediate to major. Um, and most of the surgical categories are in those three. Yeah. Uh, and we just talked about some of these. These are very, very common. It would be yeah. surprising to have almost any patients that come through who don't have one who don't or have two. at least one, even under yeah. 40s, it's, yeah. they, they're going to have some of these um, parallel ileus post-surgery, which needs to be Look, due to surgery. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So most of our patients um, will have at least one of these. I mean, particularly um, delirium due to their surgery or mm -hmm. due to sedation. Um, anemia, extremely common in our patients on admission or after their surgery when they've lost a couple of units of blood and so that will be due to the surgery due to blood loss and you'll get that in and then if they also have a low ferritin you'll say that they've got iron deficiency and then you'll give them some iron and your scoring points. You're still doing all the work, we know we use a lot of IV iron, show us why we're doing it and if we give transfusions show us why we're doing it. Peritonitis, I mean that person with the cirrhosal tear, yep. they would have had a localised peritonitis. Mm. That's probably what caused their ileus and then we manage the ileus. So you can see how a lot of this really comes in. It's not game playing, it's documenting what we actually did. Here's a couple of specific conditions, so laparoscopic cholecystectomies, like everyday procedure, Absolutely. literally. Gastroenteritis, another very common procedure. It doesn't always require admission, but we mm. do deal, certainly deal with that. Mm. And sometimes that's an accompanying procedure, uh, condition with other uh, reasons that they're admitted. That's um, really important because actually lap collies are a day stay procedure now. So when I you know, qualified, we didn't even do laps, lap collies, they were all open, they all stayed five to seven days. Mm -hmm. Then they went to laparoscopic and they all stayed three to five days. Now they come in in the morning, they're through the day stay unit and they're out. So if they stay in hospital, they must have some other complexity, otherwise they shouldn't be here. Mm. And likewise, gastroenteritis, home management unless you're an unwell person, and then you're going to be being admitted because you're dehydrated, because you've got delirium, because you've got renal impairment, because you've got a high output stoma, or something else that we actively needed to manage for you. So we're going to include these lists and others uh, in a poster, which is going to be in the description below this video for you to download and use. Lovely. Um, your 
quite passionate about stoma care. Yeah, look, a lot of people don't know much about stomas and they kind of shy away from them. But I, I, I would be in that category, <laughs> yes. Yeah. T yeah. Teach me more, look, Jane. we're really comfortable with stomas in gastroenterology, so our surgeons create them and we manage lots of patients with them. So, um, you know, if stomas are bleeding, then hemorrhage from stoma is something that's important to code. Don't just kind of say there's you know, a little bit of bleeding. I mean, if they need to have management, we can label it hemorrhage. It's, it's better recognised. Infection as well, leaking from stomas, that's actually something that drives a lot of care because if people have a leaky stoma, they'll often need to be admitted because, you know, faecal incontinence, whether it's from a stoma or from your own natural bottom, is a really unpopular thing. Um, it leads often to wound breakdown, to skin breakdown, to cellulitis, to infection. So make sure that, you know, if you've got that, and anything else happens that they're all due to. Um, a high output ileostomy, so that may well be due to an adhesion or due to a stricture or due to infection. So make sure you get the due to, and then if they're admitted because they're dehydrated, make sure that we link it all the way through. Um, stenosis or stricture of stoma, I've just mentioned. If someone's got a high output stoma, for goodness sake, take off the stoma bag and put your finger in because you're not going to know whether the symptoms are due to a stenosis or a stricture if you don't examine the stoma. Um, and if you're not going to examine the stoma, please, you know, get over that or find someone who will. Oh, it's I'll... actually, you know, an easy thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. I was quite fascinated that you broke down very simply the difference between dehiscence and breakdown. Yeah, so we were talking earlier and um, de I was asked a question like, are these the same thing? So dehiscence um, can apply to a stoma, it can also apply to any wound. That's when you, you know, you've created a join between two things in the gut or the gut and the skin in the case of a stoma and it breaks apart. It's like a, a wound breaking down or a wound dehiscence. But often in the notes it's not clear to the coders and things like breakdown can be said. So if it's a wound dehiscence, please use the right terminology because it makes it easier. Because sometimes we write skin breakdown and what we mean is that you've developed a rash on the skin or a skin scald or cellulitis due to a leak from a stoma or um, a reaction to the stoma appliance. So again, it's spelling it out, um, not looking through our tunnel vision and making it obvious to someone who's not in our craft group who can understand. Mm. So here's another example. So this patient's been admitted for two days with a diagnosis of gastroenteritis due to norovirus, a reasonably common virus around. Mm. Um, the comment is they looked dry, dry MM membranes, IBT given. So it's reasonably scant on the uh, descriptive terminology there. And then minor complexity of um, $1,000, 200 funding. Now just being in hospital for two days without doing anything or even seeing a doctor that is going to cost it. something like five to eight thousand you know just the baseline so uh, we've got a problem there uh, compared we do, to yeah. if we were to say they have dehydration um, and that we gave intravenous fluids to address the dehydration rather Which than just listing due the features to. due to the gastroenteritis, excellent. You've just increased the complexity to 4,000, which is going to better reflect the expenditure yeah. on their admission. And look, I'm going to be an older senior clinician here and say I still think we're undercoded on this one yeah. because anyone who needs admission for two full days because of gastroenteritis who was dry is going to be elderly, frail and with other comorbidities. A young person does not need to come into hospital with gastroenteritis unless there's something outrageous going on. Mm. And to stay two days, really, you've got to have had other complications. A young person who's just feeling a bit flat with gastroenteritis, we'd give them one to two litres and have them home in 12 hours. Absolutely. You know, often just ED, they can turn them Absolutely, around Absolutely, really through the AMU or something like yeah. that. Yep. Um, Jane's already touched upon, I think, most of these areas of allied health mm. to just reinforce, like, we are very dependent on our allied health colleagues to help our patients recover mm. and the coding through our documentation and theirs as well mm. being specific about malnutrition or in some cases malabsorption more yep. common in, in your field than most mm -hmm. others mm -hmm. um, again refeeding syndrome doesn't fit but um, electrolyte imbalances documented as deficiency yeah. of magnesium so it's about balance. using the specific words isn't it yeah, and so deficiency about. is seen by the coders and look, it's a good word because we do get potassium deficiency, magnesium deficiency, iron deficiency. It's easy to write, it's very clear, and it can be seen and it can be coded for. Not if we don't manage it though. So mm. don't just say someone's iron deficient and do nothing about it. Mm. That's not good medicine and it's also not going to help in terms of the coding. Uh, and you've seen this theme before, but you know, those people that come in for a pelvic exanteration mm. are the really complex oh, um, yeah. surgery. 
spend a long time in ICU, a long time on the ward, sometimes weeks in hospital. Absolutely. It's just natural, the human condition, to then have um, you know, depressive feelings or adjustment mm. disorder or mm. become more anxious about mm -hmm. the ongoing management, mm -hmm. being worried about another complication just yeah, around absolutely. the corner. And we need to reflect that so that we can fund our psychological services as absolutely. inpatients. Absolutely, yeah. And we're actually looking at that at the moment to try and um, pre-fund their psychology so that they come into hospital better prepared. Yeah, absolutely. So just to, what last topic to finish on is just about the use of antibiotics and also microbiology. Um, so there are a lot of use of prophylactic antibiotics in the perioperative field and so being specific about the kefazolin or mm -hmm. the stat of mm -hmm. vancomycin uh, or other medications that are being used as a, a surgical prophylaxis, please use that kind of terminology so we know that's the role versus those that are maybe commenced on admission, uh, the old triple antibiotics or yeah. more use of uh, piperacillus and tazobactin these days. Um, needs to be very clear about what we are treating, you know, empirical coverage mm. for peritonitis versus we've actually grown something from the surgical specimens or from blood cultures mm. and then we can specify that. Is it related to sepsis or septic shock? Mm -hmm. Is there resistance? All mm -hmm. of those things add complexity in a very significant way. Yeah, so I think it's again just that really important thing about being specific. What are you doing something for? The same should be with any blood products. We shouldn't just be seeing a unit of blood ordered. It should be given for specific indications like, you know, haemoglobin under 100 with symptoms or with risk factors for cardiac failure. Yeah, absolutely. And same with antibiotics. So just to reinforce those messages in case mm. they haven't been already, <laughs> we really want to be very specific uh, about uh, the issues that are occurring and the relationships they have using diagnostic terminology, not just impressions and assumptions. Mm -hmm. And all of those things are going to document to add complexity to ensure that the coding is actually reflecting what's happened uh, as an inpatient. And that allows us to have data accuracy. And I know that data accuracy is not just important for research, funding and clinical performance, but sometimes these also feed into other databases that are helping inform future improvements or national statistics. Absolutely. Um, safe care, informing more efficient way of developing care pathways. Um, you know, we've developed a lot of ERAS protocols in surgery, which is um, the early mobilisation of patients and shorter stays. And this has been able to be you know, possible because of collecting data that informs the care. Now that we have an electronic medical record, if we collect the data better, we can accelerate our ability to have these insights and to you know, check whether things are safe or not safe. So it's going to help us deliver better care tomorrow as well. Professor Andrews, thank you for joining us. Thank you for asking. And thanks for pleasure. watching Back at Home or at Work.